episode 18 of Top of Mind with Concilio Wealth. We are back today with a very action-packed uh, agenda, <laughs> actually hot off the press right now. The FDIC seizes Silicon Valley Bank. So if you are uh, sitting on your browser, you're seeing this, you probably already got a ping on your phone. It is Friday, March 10th at 9.40 in the morning Pacific time. We were going to talk about Silicon Valley Bank we will talk about it a little bit later, but that is uh, obviously very, very top of mind in the news right now and could have some pretty interesting effects on the economy. But before we get there, we're going to touch consumer spending. We're going to touch rate hikes. I feel like we touch rate hikes every time, yeah. but there is some significant news that, that came out in the last Fed meeting that we wanted to share um, uh, and then a couple of other things. So that's the hot off the press agenda for today. Yeah, and I hope the news on Silicon Valley Bank by the time this publishes doesn't get stale. Um, or worse. Yeah, or worse. <laughs> yeah, where this could be the first, like the last draw, and it creates this cascading. We'll, we'll get into that, but I think that's that's something that, that's fluid. We were just now hearing this news, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, we were just, as we were prepping for this this podcast, you know, I was just saying, whoa, the FDIC sees the bank. I, that, that's, I didn't, I didn't know that was going to happen. And then, you know, boom, it was very, very quick. California stepped in and, and seized the bank. Yeah. Well, F FDIC is the insurance. So yeah, the feds, <laughs> the feds stepped in and hopefully prevented contagion. And I guess we'll get into that. Isn't it run by, so it's, it's, FDIC, F being the federal, but isn't it isn't it sub managed by states? Because I was seeing a post that said that that California stepped in, which it yeah. So that's yeah, the works. hands on people will be California based. F yeah, yeah, representatives. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well, um, before we just we have to just put a lid on our excitement there for talking. Well, not really excitement, but just uh, <laughs> yeah. just talking concern, about that, I guess. So. <laughs> the yeah. concern, maybe. Yeah. So let's go to consumer spending. So. Uh, this is interesting. What are you seeing in consumer spending? Yeah, right this now? might be pretty abrupt starting from Silicon Valley Bank, but I I promise you this is like setting up all the background on how we got here, right? So consumer spending, yeah. uh, I think it's a good place to start because with all these rate hikes, the hope is people spend less and save more, right? By doing that, we slow down the economy a bit and then we slow down inflation. And I think that's one of the biggest things with raising rates is if you're getting 5% in your money market or your, your, your treasury bills and notes, that, that should be a no brainer to stop, stop spending and start saving money. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we're not seeing is people are spending like crazy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've been out to a restaurant lately, Chris, I know you have, I have, but, um, any restaurant that mm -hmm. we've chosen, um, whether previously popular or not, they're all crowded and people are spending like mm -hmm. mad and we're seeing it with less with big ticket items, but more and more with like the, the Disneyland's and the, the experiential, ex like, like the exper experience based type of spending. We can't get enough mm -hmm. of it. And I think we're spending and spending and spending and it, there's no signs of slowing. That's because jobs are so plentiful, right? We got a jobs report mm -hmm. that came in like 331,000 jobs added. We just don't have enough workers. So uh, the, the thinking there, which isn't really showing out, is if this many jobs are available and not enough people to fill those jobs, uh, employers need to suddenly raise salaries to attract more people. Salaries aren't really keeping pace with inflation or or the number of jobs available would suggest. So I think that component is breaking down. I know we talked about Supercore, like how your barber would never rate uh, lower their never yeah lower. lower their prices mm -hmm. but i think we're seeing wages in the service sector like if you're getting a job at a, a red lobster or something they're most likely not going to start paying you 50 dollars an hour 100 dollars an hour to because i don't think they're i think they're desperate but i don't think they're that desperate to bring in mm -hmm. bodies hmm. yeah interesting i was reading about this as well and part of this is related to this ongoing goalpost that we keep moving out for this pending recession 
right? Or impending yeah. recession. It's like, okay, in six months, we're going to be in recession. In six months, we're going to be in recession. How many times have we <laughs> How many times reset this now? Reset, like, rolled the six months out. I like, kept rolling it out. Reset the goalpost, yeah. right? And, and so part of the theory here is that what's holding up consumer spending or one of the things that's holding up consumer spending outside of strong job market is that people are fearing this impending sort of bad event, recession, the R word. So it's like, eh, I'm just going to spend now. I'm going to do the trip now. I got the money now. I'm doing it. Yeah. So as a result, the U.S. savings rate has plummeted. It's recovered a little bit from its low, but it's plummeted off of its prior high. Uh, but that's one of the theories is that until or if we ever have this recession, well, I'll spend now because yeah. I got the money. Another thing that I float around, I think a newsletter is going to publish on this one where expectations, mm -hmm. right? I want to go to Disneyland because Disneyland's raised their prices 20% or so in the last six months. They're going to raise them again. So I want to go before the price goes up. <clears throat> yeah, I remember you were talking about that too, because you were talking about how if the perceived, this is a newsletter, everybody. This is <laughs> like and subscribe. But if the, like and subscribe. If the perceived price of something is, go, is going to be higher in the future, even if I don't want that thing today, I'm going to buy it today it's because gonna get, I view it I think as it's actually saving expensive. money. Yeah, which I, bit, mm -hmm. I think is a bit of a folly in terms of how investors think, but a, we're trying to get in the mind of the consumer and I could see falling in that where remember the, the big mad dash to get uh, holiday toys and, and appliances in 2021 when we had the supply crunch, right? There was a, there's a yep. notice shortage in toilet paper. Well, I'm going to run and get as much toilet paper as possible making the shortage worse. I think what we're seeing is on a, on a service scale, which is harder to quantify or visually see because you, you could see empty shelves that should have toilet paper in them. You really can't see that with hotels or with the airlines because you only see what's in, you know, available on your reservation or your plane, right? Or, or your building. So yeah, it's, it's happening still. I think there's a just mad dash to spend down all of our money, which I think is dangerous. And I, I think this causes the Fed, right? So the next topic would be to raise rates, right? How to, if 5% savings yields aren't, you know, producing more savers, the what will, right? How mm -hmm. far do we have to go to, to really slow down spending? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a side, I've started to see limits on, on certain things. Um, at the store, I was at Costco the other day and there was a, a two, you know, purchase two uh, no more than two of their toilet papers. So I don't know if there's a shortage on that again, or if there's a run on toilet paper again or whatever, but you know, you can't walk out of there with four giant things of <laughs> yeah. TP right now. You can only get two. Well, I doubt the, 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 so. um, the cashiers are policing that pretty heavily, but if I were uh, a store owner, like a Costco and, and I say, you know what? I could sell more toilet paper by by implying that there's a shortage in toilet paper and say, Hey, there's a limit and cause people to buy more. You think mm -hmm. about those, uh, <laughs> those furniture stores. Interesting. Yeah. If I normally yeah. buy one, I'll buy two. Cause there's a limit. Yeah. yeah it's like a bit of psychology of uh, the furniture stores in at least here in Northern California always do that where they like, Oh, liquidation sale. You're not going to be able to get this couch. You better get your butt in here yeah. and start buying some furniture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cynical part of me of uh, the retail side. So do we have to go into recession to fix all this? Like consumer spending is high. That's in part contributing to inflation. People aren't saving. Interest rates are high, higher than they were. And it's certainly slowing things, but it's doesn't seem to be doing much. What's your take? Yeah, I think, I think we have to, I think we have to start getting pretty, scary about, uh, getting people to spend less. Um, mm. if I were to stop the average Joe on the street and say, Hey, what are interest rates doing? They would probably get, give me a sense that they're high, but not to where, you know, they, they're, they should be slowing down the spending. Like they, they just don't grasp what main street doesn't grasp what the feds doing or trying to do and what could be potentially down the road. Right. Um, mm -hmm. In a lot of people's mind, again, I'm just using a lot of anecdotal conversations with my friends where, who are non-financial professionals. I guess we do have friends outside of the, the industry, 
but they don't have a um, a care or sense of of the impending situation other than the worst case scenario. So, like a gradual slowdown, I don't think that's really in the purview in a lot of people's minds. And I think it's always like today in the next day that's in their minds, not six months down mm-hmm. the road, which I think we'll see mm-hmm. more and more of the impacts of the, the successive rate increases we've seen all year. And I think there's Let me ask you this. Yeah, mis, just mis, misunderstanding or not really a care for it. So let me ask you this. Have you and your family changed your spending habits in the last six to 12 months? Not. Or how have those changed for you? Yeah, not as a significantly um but again we don't have we don't we don't carry a lot of debt either that have has impacted us our savings rate has ticked up but it isn't um the exponential amount or it's it's been gradual um Mm -hmm. the rainy day fund has kind of been around but it isn't it hasn't doubled in size in 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 you know um in preparation for doom, if you know what I mean, like, so there's there's things that we that we've done, but not not prepping for doomsday here. So you're still, you know, you're still planning the vacation, and you're still going out to eat. Versus, I'm going to convert completely to cooking in because it's cheaper, and like you're you're still kind of spending normally in a, in a normal year. Maybe saved a little bit more, but spending pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, outside of canceling a few memberships that we don't use it's, it's it's part for the course i don't see uh but again we haven't spent an outsized amount heading into this either so yeah. um yeah. yeah our family situation might be different but yeah yours yours might be different too right like are you guys doing anything differently uh, not not really and maybe this is too you know as we interview each other here here's the problem right we're not really doing anything differently we we cook a lot, so we eat in a we lot. Too, in yeah. fact, we haven't eaten out very much at all. That's partially just having a young kid at home. <laughs> uh, they just ruin you your life for really four get... years, right? I mean, it's, you know, you're not going out to, to dinner. Um, but we, and when we do order out, I typically go get it. Um, I mean, we're still planning vacations. We're still planning things. I even bought a car last year. How bad is that? Well, again, <laughs> but, but I think we're, I think we're odd because we're we're not spending like there's no tomorrow, and it does in the data look like the majority of Americans are are spending like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. So that's true. Yeah. I mean, we we save. I mean, we save a significant portion of our our income. We're we're we. We are probably like many of our clients. We save a lot of money. Um, it's just how we work. You know, we don't spend like there's no tomorrow, as you said. It's, uh, yeah, we just tend to keep our expenses reasonable. So yeah, yeah, maybe that's unique. I don't know. Yeah. So going down to um, one of the t- subtopics in this, with uh, specifically cars, um, the thousand, the number of thousand dollar payments we've talked about. But the mm-hmm. number of underwater drivers is suddenly creeping up as well, which makes sense, right? The, the the value of used cars is coming down, which I knew a lot of people who kind of assumed that same thing where uh, they saw the value of their used cars come up. They would they, – they think, you know, foolishly that their the used cars would still continue to raise in value. Which isn't the mm-hmm. case, right? That's like uh, we saw that with homeowners or home buyers in 2006, where it's just going to keep going up. And I don't the price I pay today, I'm going to be missing out on gains for the next month, two months, right? And car one mm-hmm. shouldn't be viewed as an investment. Neither should a house. No, I guess we'll get into that in a later episode. But mm-hmm. the number of people paying more than a thousand dollars per month is pretty well publicized. But underwater issues are now coming into play because the value of those expensive car payments are coming down. And if you're one of those drivers who refresh your cars every three or four years, you might run into problems. Hmm. And yeah, there's this meme about this lady who bought a Ford Escort in 1998 Ford Escort for 
$5,000 or something and she had to finance it. And like it's, it's hitting expensive car buyers, but it's all hitting, it's also hitting, you know, entry level. I, I guess, I don't know how to describe a 1998 Ford Escort purchase, but it's impacting the low end car buyer as well. Yeah, everything is more. <clears throat> I guess on the good news there, well, I think your comments are these people that bought in the last, say, 12 months likely overpaid. I think the people that are buying now, it's more reasonable. I keep getting emails, you know, not not to buy my used car anymore, which should have sold at the high. Anyway, <laughs> didn't do it. But, but the I keep coming, getting these emails. Yeah. Now we have all this inventory and thirty five hundred dollars off MSRP and all this stuff, right? And so they're they're now trying to to swing the fence the other day the other way. So I think that's good news because that does mean that at least some element of these rate hikes is slowing. Yep. You know, they need to move cars. And and so if prices are coming down, incentives are going up in order to compensate for I don't know what car rates are now, six, seven, eight percent or something now to, to finance for car. new, yeah. And use you know, is in the double digits now. That's yeah. good. So that's, that's, yeah, wild. that's wild. And people are still buying. It's not like the car market, also wild. car market has completely dried up. And that's, that's what the impact of interest rates should have done. But it, that's what mm -hmm. concerns me about the consumer spending kind of spending us into a deeper recession than necessary. It was interesting to me though, too. I, you know, I bought this car last year and, and it was, it was used. I didn't have to put any money down. I did, but I, I was alarmed that I could walk out of there with basically nothing. It's the keys in the car. Yeah. You mean you don't need any money? You just, you'll finance the whole thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But, oops, sorry. <laughs> that was interesting to me, you know? So I feel like every other car I've ever bought, I've had to put at least some amount of money down. Just seems strange. Of course, people are underwater. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to our next topic. Rate hikes. So the Fed met last week and uh, let's just, let's have you brief us on what they did and what they said um, and potentially, potentially why. Yeah. The Fed initially, one, let's address what happened in February. They hiked a quarter of a mm -hmm. point and Jay Powell came out relatively soft in terms of his, his post uh, speech. Um, Soft meaning suggesting that they were pretty much done with the jumbo hikes, the 50, 50 basis points and the 75 basis points. And just last week, they changed their tune. And mm -hmm. the open open mouth committee where they're going out and sounding the alarm of, we're not done yet. The data is strengthening, which is good in a normal environment, but we don't want a strengthening uh, economy in an inflationary environment, right? Just it gives more people uh, reason to buy, buy and buy and buy, and driving up inflation or keeping the cycle going at least. So uh, the last week they came out probably the strongest language in this particular end of the cycle, where the odds of inflation went from or inflation the rate hikes went from uh, eighty percent odds for twenty five basis points to twenty percent odds to 50 basis points prior to this meeting that one day mm. it, sh it completely <clears throat> flip-flopped where now the odds on a 50 percent or a half a percent hike in two weeks is at 80 percent oh wow meaning yeah the odds completely flipped so there's the odds of a 25 basis point hike are pretty much diminished which is that day uh, you can point to the rally fizzling out, and that's what really caused this this sell off that we're experiencing now. How how do these odds work? Is this like Vegas style betting, or how how does when you quote this number, eighty percent chance of a half a percent rate hike in two weeks? But how do you, how does that how does that factor? Yeah, uh, the CME group. I, have, I guess we'll post the website, but the CME group does post a free free to access futures component about um, <clears throat> about what what the futures price or futures market is pricing into the the market so if, it's mm. not quite Vegas style but it is people making 
bets on expectations of the future. And uh, so it's Wall Street betting. It's Wall Street buying a a contract that says this is what we think is going to happen. And then as more contracts go that direction, that increases the predictive odds. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's not it's Wall like Street bets, so to speak, but pressure. it is. Yeah, it is uh, quite a bit of um, institutions, banks, things like that are trying to lock in future rates. I know that Jay Powell was also, I guess, deposed as the, the, the official term. He was deposed by um, uh, a number of people uh, this week. He does that twice a year, which is basically a requirement of the Fed to um, stand up in front of a, a number of other lawmakers and kind of defend their decisions or explain their decisions more. Did anything significant come out of that conversation? At Outside all? of his initial remarks about um, about needing flexibility of higher rate hikes in this next meeting, in the April meeting, uh, it was just politicians politicking. Yeah, they were just Okay. They weren't even asking relevant questions. They were just grandstanding because they knew people were watching. Got it. So, uh, outside of his initial comments, the uh, the market did could care less what really any politician had to ask post post that. So the biggest thing is, Got it. we're not done. We're we're gonna probably most likely gonna drop another jumbo hike in a few weeks. We'll see. We'll report back in a few weeks. <clears throat> All right, so our next item here we have is addressing the junk rally. Uh, this is an interesting phrase, so let's unpack that. Yeah, we Chris and I mentioned this, I think, two episodes ago where um, we we were a little iffy about the rally. It looked like a lot of the retail names were were leading the charge, right, the GameStops of the world. But we said it probably shouldn't matter for the long-term investor, and I totally agree with that. Um uh, just because we had a sell-off doesn't mean uh, we're, we're heading back to October lows. I doubt that. I I know we have more hikes in the in our near-term future, and that's what the market's pricing in. But to me, that's a good sign because there's a fundamental reason for the risk-off mentality. So just because we call it a junk rally doesn't mean it isn't sustainable, right? Uh, Let's go back as far back to 2020, where the, the same smart money, right, said the rally since April of 2020. So I don't know if you remember, the, there's a the massive crash in March. Late March, we had this recovery. And then April, mm -hmm. in May, we had this very strong rally. And the smart money was saying, stay on the sidelines, don't, don't invest. We're going to have a double dip. And were they right? No, they were couldn't be further from the further from the truth, and they lagged, right? Yeah. And so that just points to the power of retail investors, and they can they can outlast certain smart money talking heads out there, right? Even if you're mm -hmm. running money for J.P. Morgan or a big bank like that, and you have billions of dollars at your disposal for investing, you're not moving the market. The market still dictates whether it's retail or smart money. Um, again, I hate that they coin themselves, you know, the, the smart money and then the retail investors, dumb money, but they created the name. So I guess they can be uh, as complimentary or as insulting as possible, <laughs> depending on who they focus on, <laughs> yeah. but they, they're wrong. They, they've been wrong in 2020 and they, they don't know what the future holds more than, you know, some guy in the basement in New Jersey trading on Wall Street bets knows, right? So mm -hmm. what we're saying is, yeah, the, the rally fizzled. I get it. But it doesn't mean retail investors should pack it in and go away. I think there's, I think they have strength. I think they have uh, quality research, a lot of them, right? They're not just all buying their favorite names, right? Or buying bankrupt companies. They, there's some really mm -hmm. smart retail traders out, out there that Wall Street just just tries to insult it every turn they can. Well, I, I think the most notable when we think smart money, oftentimes that points to like hedge funds, right? And hedge funds are inherently making big bets to try to go, whether it's take a lot less risk than the market or try to beat the market on the upside or the downside, something like that. And, you know, you pointed this out that a lot of the 
get quote smart money was in cash for most of this rally. So they missed it. And so, you know, if they're coming out saying, yeah, we, you know, we hope it goes back down, that makes their returns look better when they were otherwise just sitting in, in cash or T-bills yeah. or whatever they were buying. And, so, <clears throat> yeah. And that could sustain a retail rally because all these guys who are sitting on the sidelines, like they did in 2020, they just pack it in and start mm-hmm. investing months, months after the fact. And I mm-hmm. think that shows the power of retail investors who, who have been making good bets in the last few years outside of the big headline trades, right? So so we can't dismiss retail traders as dumb money. Yeah. Let's talk about growth and value stocks. So there's been a really interesting thing that's going on with particularly a lot of tech stocks, but some other stocks that have both come down a lot in the last year and then also stocks that have gone up a lot in the last year. Um, <clears throat> you have in here, Microsoft is being classified partly as a growth stock and partly as a value stock. I have no idea what that means. What does that mean? Yeah, this is a great article on uh, CNBC by Bob Pisani. Uh, he is one of their C- uh, anchors or commentators. He's, I don't really watch. Bob's been there a long yeah, time. Yeah, he's been there a long time, but he wrote a great article about uh, growth stock versus value stock. It's all in the value, uh, eye of the beholder. So, like you mentioned, Chris, Microsoft is both because it pays a dividend. But you don't think of it as Microsoft, a big time tech company, as a value stock because you think of it as a tech stock, right? And right. how we measure value versus growth. And I'm, tra- I'm treading into tricky territory here. Uh, and we, we look at things differently other than style boxes, right? So if you, you go to a financial advisor or through a do it yourselfer with uh, research. They'll say, hey, you should own X amount in large cap value, X amount in small cap value, X amount. Like there's nine boxes. It goes from value on the left to growth on the right with blend right in the middle. Mm-hmm. What Bob mm-hmm. is saying, Microsoft is both. It's a blend stock. It, and that makes sense, right? What really insightful about that article was uh, what's being defined as growth in this environment. It's oil companies. So ExxonMobil is suddenly a growth company. Chevron's a growth company. And by definition, that actually makes a ton of sense because uh, we look at what's called factors and the, the oil companies have a lot of momentum behind them, upwards momentum. Mm-hmm. Tech stocks have momentum as well, but it's negative momentum. So if you want to build mm-hmm. a growth, a growth uh, portfolio in this environment and you're using these screens, you're picking up oil companies. And we've ex- expressed doubt about oil companies where the price of oil goes up, but it does go down, right? It's all, it's all supply and demand driven. Um, tech stocks. I think we mentioned this too in newsletters and in previous episodes where Netflix is suddenly a value stock. Meta is a value stock because they're trading at very low premiums for, for valid reasons, right? Everyone has doubts about Netflix's growth and – Meta's ability to, I guess, make money off a shrinking user base, right? Or a not so growing user base. So they're being viewed and they're being priced as value companies. So if you wanted a value portfolio, you got to know what you're investing in because a lot of these value indexes will start picking up these or have already picked up some of these names that you would traditionally think as tech. Interesting. I remember when our, our financial planning software actually recategorized Meta as a value stock. I was looking at that for yeah, a, yeah. a client that works there and I was just going through their allocation and like, whoa, wait, what? Yeah. This is a value stock? And this is when it was at like 90 bucks a share, which, you know, the technical definition of value is undervalued stock. Relative to the market. So, yeah, yeah. Rel- relative to the market. And, and you know, look at look at where it is today price wise relative to that that low, but still. Yeah, I guess a lot of these companies are are value companies at this point. Yeah, and if you're buying an index, it again, it it's not it is it should be set and forget if you buy like a broad based index. But if you're tilting value or growth and you you think you know what you're doing, that's what you have to kind of look for uh, when you're buying a value index or a ETF. You know what I mean? You have to mm-hmm. you have to know what's mm-hmm. in it or what could potentially go into it. And if that's what you want to own, mm-hmm. that's fine. Right? And <clears throat> Interesting. So oil, so my takeaways are oil stocks are now being treated as growth. 
certain tech stocks are kind of in the middle, like Microsoft, and then you've got companies like Meta that are more on the value side. Would that also suggest that some of these small tech companies that have come down a lot could be value stocks, or is that like is a value stock can a value stock be one that burns cash and loses money, or does a value stock have to also fit in that you know they have a good balance sheet, they pay a dividend, that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, it could be both. It depends on how you screen for value. Yes, yes. So, uh, so value relative to itself. Let's say on a non-GAAP basis, you, you aren't quite making money, but you're you're not trading at the premiums you previously did. You can actually be defined as value depending on how the eye of the beholder, right? Who's screening for it? And if the screening rules allow for uh, unprofitable companies that are trading below its previous highs, there that some certain value screens will pick that up. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. So again, I'm not suggesting everyone go out and understand what the underlying index rules are because <laughs> you'll just bore yourself to death, but uh, that can really impact a portfolio when it rebalances. And we went through a rebalance on major portfolios in December, and guess what a lot of growth ETFs picked up? A lot of oil companies. Hmm. Because of the momentum. Because of the momentum, yeah. That's also interesting, too, because a lot of oil companies pay dividends, and Growth companies don't always pay dividends, yes. and then you've got, you know, we just said, well, Meta is a value company, but Meta doesn't pay a dividend. So things are all sorts of weird out there right now. Yes. Well, well again, I, I promise we'll kind of chip away at the confusion of factors, but in an academic mm-hmm. sense, value companies actually carry more risk than growth companies. Yeah. But yeah. value companies don't stay value, that. and gr- growth doesn't stay growth. They, they, they mm-hmm. change based on what's happening with the stock's behavior. Yeah, Microsoft was probably a value company for the 17 years. It was between 25 and 32 a share. Yes, yeah. And then it switched back over to a growth company. Yeah, when uh, Nadelic take, took over, right? And I think that's when exactly. they went yeah. to full-on growth, yeah. All right, let's shift over to Silicon Valley Bank. And let's unpack this a little bit more for our listeners before we wrap up. So. From what you can tell, I know this is kind of very new news, but what's happening? Yeah, yeah. I think the junk rally kind of caused the strong language that's funneling into this, meaning uh, we we quoted the CME odds of uh, jumbo rate hike. That's because Jay Powell came out and said, financial conditions are getting too loose. We need to We need to tighten and get people to spend less, right? So it's all coming full circle. So this is one of the the side effects or consequences, unintended or not, of raising rates quickly the way we have, right? And with more on the way. So without Jay Powell's comments last week, I think uh, Silicon Valley Bank probably would run into this issue anyway. So what's happening Mm -hmm. is, and what makes them so special, or not so special, is uh, as the name suggests, they're located in the San Jose area, Silicon Valley, but they feed into venture capital companies. So that's that's tech companies, healthcare companies that are all startup. So what happens when you raise rates? These companies suddenly have a tougher time accessing capital because they're nonprofit, non profitable at the they're not non profit by any sense, but they're unprofitable and to operate day to day they need to new cash injections, right? And that's through series funding, through through loans, through cap, any way you could access capital to keep going as a business, right? Mm-hmm. So when rates go up, uh, venture capitalists suddenly have a higher hurdle rate, right? I need to clear at least a 5% risk-free and mm-hmm. giving money to any old company or any old startup all of a sudden looks more expensive to me because it is. Right, that's the fundamental math of investing in a startup, and if if that's drying up, these startups who had money in the bank for dry powder, they're suddenly drawing out their dry powder to operate, and I think that's the biggest thing where they're all banked at the one bank, that's SIVB or Silicon Valley Bank, and all of a sudden they all want their money to operate. 
and we we mentioned banks don't hold 100 percent of deposits right because if i have a million dollars in deposits i'm loaning out nine hundred thousand of it right because the reserve requirements are around 10 to 12 percent so i'm holding a hundred thousand dollars in the bank so if i have five hundred thousand dollars of withdrawals required which is only half of my depositors all of a sudden i can't give money because the cash in my vault has already been lent out right so that's that's what's causing the that's what we call a bank run meaning enough depositors who want their money back i thought that a lot of this happened so and 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 help me here there was like a 20 billion dollar uh, 20 billion of bonds that they ended up taking about a 10% loss on. So they needed to raise about $2 billion. So then they went to the equity markets to sell shares, to raise that money, to put it in the bank, to meet their collateral requirements. Exactly. Where do I have exactly. that wrong? You or, got it right on. That, mm-hmm. So what I was explaining was that first domino that fell was these, which is the loss. No, these verse, uh, these, uh, ver- venture capital companies are these startups. So needed uh-huh. cash desperately. So they all went to the bank at the same time. So that forced uh, that forced Silicon Valley Bank to sell that twenty billion plus of bonds they were holding that they thought were safe, but they didn't need to access for years down the line. Or got it. didn't need to access all at once. I think that's the issue is yeah, if it if you need to sell five billion, you're you're solvent, right? But if I'm putting a deposit in the bank that bank is trying to earn interest on that deposit yep. Yep. right whether through right. loans or through investment and they sold 22 billion dollars with the bonds that were that took a big hit, hit because bonds were the worst performer last year even though there were safe treasures. got it so they sold they sold okay so here's a chain of events as i understand it you tell me where i have this wrong so basically there was a run on the bank Small companies that bank there needed cash. Uh, I got to go get my cash out to spend on my business. Yep. So the n- amount of deposits that, that Silicon Valley Bank has has shrunk. Yep. Then they were too off balance on their reserve requirements. So they had to sell holdings on their balance sheet in order to convert those to cash. Yep. They sold about $20 billion of bonds at roughly a 10% markdown. Yep. So they got, say, $18 billion for that. And then they were still two billion short, yeah. and so they couldn't afford to take that loss. So then they went to the equity markets and they said, "Well, let's sell shares, which is a common thing that companies do. We'll sell shares to raise that two billion, so everything is whole and and the bank is fine." And uh, news broke of that. The stock went down sixty percent, and I believe the stock went down sixty percent again. Yeah. So it's two sixty percent drops in two days. When the stock price drops a lot, it makes it very very hard to raise that amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you have to sell a lot of shares um, in order to do that. Do I have That's that? exactly, exactly right. right. Yep. And then why did the FDC have to come in and FDIC have to come in and seize? So the FDIC Simply seized because, they, because, because the yeah, they, so they, they insure um, an amount up to 250000 So if, right. if a bank's at risk of not meeting those requirements, they they – enter what's called insolvency and they they take they take over the bank to make sure all the uh, depositors uh, are made whole or as made whole as they possibly can by liquidating assets to uh, find funding right so if the fed steps in as a lender of last resort they most likely will right those depositors who had that money that they thought they can take out they should be made whole and i think that's a rule coming from the Great Depression, where a bank run mm-hmm. happens, there was no making whole of depositors. Like, you had $100 in the bank, you were lucky to get $2 out, right? And then the, mm-hmm. the, the remaining $98 just vanishes in thin air. So what we what we have is a, a government takeover, but again, we have a bank that owes people money, the money that they deposited, and they can't, they can't provide that capital. So, so this is interesting. So Silicon Valley, I'm just reading straight off this article here that just posted. So Silicon Valley Bank, which is based in Santa Clara, California, they were closed today by the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, yep. 
which appoints the FDIC, the yes. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, of course, at the Fed level, to protect the insured depositors. The FDIC created the Deposit Insurance National Bank of Santa Clara, the DINB. So essentially they create a new local bank uh, and then transfer immediately. So it says at the time of closing, the FDIC as receiver immediately transferred to the DINB, the Deposit Insurance National Bank of Santa Clara, all insureds deposits of Silicon Valley Bank. They later go on to say that all insured depositors will have full access to their insured deposits no later, no later than Monday morning, so through the weekend. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing, right? <laughs> if I have money in my bank. Yeah. It, yeah, that that's such a scary thing. It's like there's money that I've earned that I can't access, and that's that's what a bank run causes is this panic of this toilet paper shortage, right? But we're talking about a shortage of actual right. money. Um, so you get – one chew to drop all of a sudden there's a mad dash to try to get liquid as possible meaning i'm trying to withdraw all my money as soon as i can and a bank even a healthy bank can't and again sibb was a very healthy bank um prior to this it's just because this also says this also says the fdic will pay uninsured depositors an advanced dividend Within the next week, uninsured depositors will receive a receivership certificate for the remaining amount of their uninsured yes. funds. As the FDIC sells the assets of Silicon Valley Bank, future dividend payments will be made to uninsured depositors. So that's the people that had over 250 in the yep. bank. Yeah. So even if you're above the limits, you're still made somewhat whole if as much as possible as the assets will cover. So, so as long as they don't have a a lot more liabilities that no one knows about. Again, pretty low odds because they're a publicly traded company. And their financial well-being prior to this was actually looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. But a trigger event like this where your entire user base is all venture capital firms, right? And that's that's one of the first things that we would expect to drop in a in a tightening econ economic cycle. So does the since the FDIC is taking over the bank, does the stock become? I know that the trading is frozen, but does it now delist because it becomes a privately held asset of the federal government? Yeah, yeah, the banks. So the any public trading on it on the bank is probably not worth anything. It's done. Yeah, because stockholders oh. are last in line. So in right, yeah. right. Well, and potentially it could then relist if the if the strategy is to spin it back out. There were. There were a handful of times in this in the financial crisis when the the Fed stepped in and took over yep. banks and then later sold them. They actually made a lot of money on yeah. that, uh, which was good. That just went back to taxpayer money because it was taxpayer money that bailed everything out. Um, in theory, that could happen here as well. Well, let's hope. I think I honestly thought let's it was hope, a well run yeah. run bank. It's just when you cater to a very very hyper specific client base, then then things like that could happen because it's it's like essentially one big client that is impacted by the great yeah, macro. It's, it's a pretty incredible workflow that, I mean, the feds will seize it on a Friday and on Monday, you know, everybody at the FDIC is working over the weekend here, but, you know, you're, you have access to all your money by Monday morning. That's a pretty incredible process, actually. I don't want to discount the fact that this bank is failing, but the fact that liquidity is there almost immediately, um, that's really good. That's a good system. Yeah, um, it's good because they get a lot of practice. So you, you wouldn't believe if you go to the FDIC website, they have a list of uh, um, insolvent banks that they took on over, mm -hmm. and the latest one was October 2020. So they do this pretty, pretty often, which is kind of scary, but kind of good that they have this in place. So these are, and and maybe we pivot into this, but SVB is a is a smaller bank. It's regional. Yep. Yeah typically smaller banks that are taken over. It is, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but then there's a contagion effect, right? So banks overall have not done well, specifically other regionals. Mm -hmm. We're talking about good name brands like PNC and and uh, well Fremont Fremont Bank where they <clears throat> there's an assumption that there's going to be a bank run on them as well or elevated stress in terms First of deposits. Yeah. 
First Republic's down First a lot Republic as well. First yeah. Smaller, smaller bank. A lot of those banks are being hit hard. So yeah, you're, the, the point is if one's failing, that might incentivize me. Oh, good, I don't bank there, but I bank at this other bank. I'm on a bail yeah. and take my money out. That could create many, many issues. Kind of the trickle, or the, uh, trickle up effect, yeah, right? Contagion, as you say. Trickle up effect, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, huh. Bank of America initially this morning on March 10th was selling off as well. So bigger banks might come under scrutiny by their depositors, not by regulators. But you know what they <clears throat> they famously pay less than one percent on their savings accounts. So how would you in, how would you incentivize someone to not pull money out? You know, and you know you're safe. What do you got to do as a bank? Raise interest rates, I hope. Right? And give people more incentive to stay. So that's that's possibly the most interesting thing that will, well, I was going to say the most positive thing, and it's totally wrong. But the big banks, as we all know, those of us that bank at the big banks, and I'm one of them, they pay nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you, you got to go to a smaller regional bank to actually get a good, a good you know, interest rate. Um, and so the effect of this could be that those big banks have to increase their savings accounts, savings account rates to incent people to keep money there instead of inducing a run on their banks as well. Yeah. And again, you don't need 100% to have a run. It's, you can be as low as 10% of the depositors yeah. wanting their money back, put your bank out of business. Yeah. Right. Because it's leveraged. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting story, right? And again, interesting story. The next bank is Silvergate Bank. They had direct uh, crypto assets, so they use crypto as collateral for the deposits, which is, I thought, was pretty insane. But super volatile. Yeah, the idea of stablecoin and things like that made it made it a very valuable company until very recently. But um, Silvergate had a very traditional banking arm as well, so they have depositors they need hmm. to make whole. They've gone. They're going out of business, or not? They're not going to be solvent anymore. So the FDIC has two pretty large banks in terms of regional banks because they are on the bigger end. Uh, that way, they have to run through this process through. And that's what we mean by potential contagion. So it happens all at the regionals, and then it kind of rolls up to the bigger banks if if it were to spread. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we'll just have to see how this story plays out. Um, you know, maybe the good news is this is smaller banks, so hopefully it doesn't bleed into the big banks as as badly. You know, we do know from the stress test this, that the Fed has put in place from the financial. That's crisis, exactly that why they the do banking that. System yeah. Is, yeah. That's exactly why they do that. But the banking system is actually really, really strong. Um, you know, all of the big banks are passing those those tests, which is good. You don't want your banking system to. To fail, that creates a very, very bad economic situation, just like in, you know, 708. So this will be an interesting story as this unfolds. We'll keep watching it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it all ties to rates, right? So, again, if spenders keep spending, we'll have to see higher rates, and we should see more bank stress like the, that we've seen. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. It'll be interesting to see how this affects the yield curve because the yield curve is still inverted which means that you can make more on a one or two or three year bond than you can on a 10 or 15 or 20 year bond, um, which is, is, is essentially saying that people are bearish in the long term, uh, so they don't want to, they don't want to buy a long term bond. We'll see if this banking issue affects that or changes the level of inversion in the coming days or weeks. Yeah. It's important to note that it, it is a bit of a risk off day. Where is that money going? Right. If people are selling their stocks, where are they, what are they buying? It's going into bonds. Yeah, it's yeah. going to treasury bonds specifically, right? So the the seven to mm -hmm. ten year treasury is up one in almost two percent today. So in a day that's mm -hmm. littered with red, there is some green, but that's what we call a risk off trade. Meaning we've mentioned the the U.S. government has never defaulted on its debt. Where where's the, the money typically goes there? Typically. Hmm. So rates are. Uh, Surprisingly, down. Rates across the board are, are down because everyone's wanting to buy a safer asset. Interesting. 
This is all over the headlines. Yeah. All right. Well, and actually, I'm just seeing here, too, uh, cryptocurrencies, which are supposed to be not correlated to normal markets and assets. You've got Bitcoin down 7% today and Ethereum down 8% today. It's been interesting to see how uh, what was thought to be something that was kind of the 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 anti yeah, yeah. Uh, is seems to be quite correlated to risk assets. Um, anyway, I just saw that flash on my screen, so I thought I'd comment on it. Yeah, I think you, you should view them as risk assets, not uncorrelated assets. I think uh, the crypto sales point is just. I think what it, that's what it was is overselling, under delivering. First Republic Bank down twenty two percent right now. The yeah SVP K K R E uh, SVB is the regional yeah, bank ETF down seven percent. DocuSign down twenty one percent today. Anyway, in other news, <laughs> but yeah, Signature Bank down twenty four. PacWest Bank Corp down thirty four. I don't know. Yeah, Western Alliance Bank Corp down forty two percent. Zion's Bank down five. So that's wow. that's where I think this makes a big story. Uh, people. Are, most likely going going back to their day to day, but when banks that have zero connection to venture capital or crypto are sinking like this, Signature Bank uh, does have a crypto wing. So, to be fair, they're they're down on they're more risky bank than a lot of others. But hmm. yeah, the the ones you mentioned, Pinnacle, Webster, uh, East West, Pinnacle Bank down Corp, five, yeah, Pack West, East West down nine, yeah, Pack West down thirty four. Uh, being a bank is not fun right now. Yet big banks. JP Morgan does it up. Big. Bank of America down one and a half. Yeah. Look at that. Wells Fargo flat. JP Morgan up. Why is JP Morgan up? I have no clue. <laughs> no clue. Don't tell me there's more buyers than sellers. Yeah, I think I think the one JP Morgan of all, a lot of these banks similar to Goldman Sachs is when merger activity slows down, investment banking activity slows down, they're mm. they're hurt because they they are a big player in that space. So, it looks like the regionals are getting hammered incredibly hard. Yep. No matter what kind yep. of exposure you have, I think it's just the, it is the market anticipating another run. They don't know who yet. Which again, I'm not seems to be doing regional, this though. to yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not doing it to instill any kind of fear. It's just the market trying to price in potential elevated risk. That's mm. what higher rates do. Citigroup flat, Wells Fargo flat. Interesting. All right, we got to wrap. All right, well, something to keep an eye on, everyone. I, again, not to, not to create panic. It's just something that we're watching. That's the news. And 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 look, uh, small banks are small by market size, so therefore you probably own them, but you own a very very small piece you should, in your yeah. otherwise yeah. well diversified portfolio. Um, and banks are a fairly small portion of the S and P five hundred as it is. But once again, you know that's concentrated with the larger banks because. You know, most investing is market cap dominant, so you're going to own more of the bigger companies yeah. than you are the smaller. This is more companies. of an so economic concern because if, if banks aren't lending, it's yeah. absolutely yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> the good news is we release every two weeks, so we won't talk about this again, you know, tomorrow. <laughs> but in two weeks, let's maybe hope it doesn't. Yeah, clarity, yeah, yeah so. hope it doesn't spread and get worse. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks everyone for joining today. 